Okay, right. So this is the last cycle. So the plan is, I'm going to do an intro today, intro to the topic. So there's no lab task for this week. Because I'm only finishing off the last assignment, getting, that, you know, getting it all wrapped up and handed in. So this is going to be a general overview. And at the end of this presentation, I'll talk about what we're going to do for the next five weeks. Okay, I've got five more topics, but not necessarily in that particular order. Okay, so we're going to talk about the cloud platform, which is kind of fundamental to what we're going to be doing for over the next six weeks. We're going to talk about how we develop software for the cloud, because it's a, it's a very different process from the, the stuff you've done already. And then we'll talk about how we store information in the cloud. So the kind of the programming, the over, overview, the programming side, and then the storage. And that kind of gives you the overview of the whole topic. Okay, so the cloud. Okay, what is the cloud? It's this big buzzword, isn't it? It's going around, you know, things are on the cloud, they're putting the business on the cloud. What does it actually mean? It is on the server, but what, so there's a bit more to it than that. Okay, let's sort of do a bit of an introduction to this, right. The cloud is sort of online storage, online stuff, isn't it? And it started off in the 70s with ARPANET, which is the f precursor to the uh, World Wide Web. Um, in the 1990s, we had the internet, which was static pages, and we had sort of CGI scripts, and we could do some sort of basic scripting. And PHP comes from the 1990s. So the technology we're using to write pages, PHP scripts, is actually a 1990s technology. It was never designed to scale properly. Um, then the first ever cloud system was something called Salesforce in 99. The idea was it was a software package which was available on the cloud. In other words, you went, you went for your web browser and you accessed the software through the web browser. And that was the big breakthrough. The idea of, having, of not having to maintain, install, update, uh, host the software yourself. Um, 2002, Amazon Web Services came about. Um, Amazon Web Services was originally just for Amazon, just for their um, online stores. That was all it was built for. It was never designed as the cloud. It was designed as a big, massive distributed system to support their, uh, their websites. The trouble was it cost billions to build, and they wanted to sort of recoup some money on it. So what they decided to do in 2006 is allow other people to use their cloud infrastructure, to use their hosting. And they only did it as a cost-cutting measure. So it was never planned from the start. So the idea was Amazon Web Services 2002 was for the internal use. 2006, they said anyone can use it. And as of now, two-thirds of the apps on your phone are powered through Amazon Web Services. It went down about 18 months ago, and it wiped out pretty much every smartphone because no, nothing could connect. No one got any data, no, no, no apps work. Things like Instagram is based on, on the Amazon Web Services. Uh, only the massive ones have got their own. So Facebook have got their own infrastructure, Google have got their own infrastructure. Uh, Twitter use Amazon Web Services. So it's massive, and I'll explain why in a minute. Okay, so biggest issue is cost. Let's imagine you come up with a fantastic cloud system, fantastic uh, social media platform, and you launch it and you've got about 500 users. Then it gets on Channel 4 News, and suddenly you get 2 million people want to access your web service, your, your, uh, your uh, social media site. Traditional way, you're stuffed, aren't you? You've bought your server, you've got LAMP set up on it, it's kind of running nicely. You get hit with 2 million users, bang, it kills the server. Your system's dead, you're out of business. The trouble is, if you scale for something huge and you don't get that massive demand, you've wasted your money, haven't you? If you have and buy the biggest server money can buy and you get 2,000 users, you've wasted you know, 20, 30,000 pounds trying to build this system. So the upfront investment is the big issue here, isn't it? If you're going to host your own systems, you've got to have a massive, you've got to have racks, you've got to have air conditioning systems, you've got to have a, ba a big internet connection, you know, a big pipe to the internet. You've got to buy the servers, you've got to upgrade them, you've got to install them, you've got to maintain them, you've got to uh, you repair them. And it kind of, and you've got to employ staff to look after them. It's a massive investment, isn't it? And the problem is, a lot of startups. Do you see? Uh, do you see Colin's talk on lean startups last week? This kind of meshes quite nicely into what Colin talked about last week, doesn't it? In terms of, if you start lean, you start small, but you scale quickly if you need to. Uh, it's the classic thing: buy versus rent, isn't it? You know, I lease my car because 
there's no point in me buying it because the residuals on the car, by the time I paid it off, it's not, it's not worth anything. So I rent it and I can change it. Okay? And the big issue here is peak demand. You've got to predict peak demand. You've got to predict what the maximum load is going to be on your server. And the trouble with, with uh, social media is if it suddenly takes off, your demand outstrips your supply and you've suddenly got a big problem and the system starts crashing. <coughs> so the idea of the cloud, it converges business requirements, in other words, the issues that businesses face, and technology. And we've finally got to the point where the two work together. We've got the technology that supports the business requirements. So the business requirements are three simple things. Cap capacity planning, in other words, make sure we've got the capacity to meet demand. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? If you have overcapacity, it's going to cost you money and waste money. If you've got undercapacity, you're going to get wiped out when you get hit. Cost reduction, you don't want to be paying for server rooms, racks, servers, salaries, hardware, when it's going to halve in value in the next sort of three months. It's a waste of money. And organisational agility, can we scale from this big to this big in two hours? And then if it suddenly shrinks again, can we reduce our cost quickly and get back to, back to a standard size? So can we scale and can we can be agile in our, in our uh, business approach? Biggest issue is capacity planning. And this is where the cloud really comes into its own. You've got this usage fluctuations. Now, a classic example, we're looking at register systems for the university. And we're thinking of hosting those on the cloud. Because between the hour and five past the hour, we're going to get hit massively, aren't we? With people registering then we're going to get 55 minutes of pretty much nothing. So we've got these massive peaks. Once every hour, we're going to get a massive peak. So we need to be able to have a very flexible system that copes with that. So off-peak times, we take the servers offline, we use them for something else. And when it comes to registering, we bring the servers online quickly. People register, then we take them offline again. So this, this, we're talking about agile, hourly agile uh, approaches. Um, Over-provision is you know it's so easy to do isn't it you know you, how big do you buy your computer well you always buy a bigger hard drive don't you than you think you're going to need you always buy more ram than you think you're going to need because in two years time you'll need it but in two years time that investment is worth so much little so so much, so much less less money so capacity planning has always been a challenge and <coughs> the technology side these are the four key areas that we're going to be working on over the next six weeks we're going to be looking at clustering. So rather than having a database system running on one server, you're going to run your database system on six servers, or eight servers, or 20 servers. Okay? So we've got almost redundancy built in. So if a server goes offline, you've, you haven't lost your data. If you get a big demand, you can bring more servers into the, into the cluster and increase capacity. And the idea is with a cluster, you should be able to very quickly add new servers into the cluster in a matter of seconds. And when the capacity drops, pull the servers out again, use them for something else. And that brings us on to virtualization. We're going to use virtualized servers. We're going to be using our Raspberry Pis for the exercise. We're going to build multiple servers on the same Raspberry Pi. We're going to create server images, very tiny images. I've run managed to run five server images on one Raspberry Pi quite easily. And the other side is you can take several hard pieces of hardware and treat it as one big server. Can you effectively merge hardware together to create a, a super server? And that's what we do. Have you heard about the, the university supercomputer? 40 teraflop computer. And it's basically a really, really high capacity bandwidth. I think it's, uh, you've heard of uh, 100 meg and gigabit ethernet. This is terabit ethernet, connecting this thing together. It's huge. And all it is is lots and lots of servers. And as we run out of capacity, we just shove an extra server in the rack. Actually, it's actually graphics cards we're using. We have racks and racks of graphics cards because GPUs are so much more powerful than CPUs. And we literally shove more, more GPUs in when we start running the shorter power. Um, grid computing is again this idea of you have a whole series of servers all working together. So clustering is where a service runs over multiple computers. Grid computing is where you have large numbers of computers you can bring on, online. You have a backup set of servers. You can just plug them into the grid. Like the national grid for you know, producing uh, electricity, you just put an extra power station online when you need extra power, you take it off again when you're finished. And storage, if, you're, if you've got hundreds of computers all working together and you can't guarantee which computer someone's going to connect to, how do you handle file storage? 
How do you handle databases? There's all sorts of issues which we need to, we need to address. So, let's go through them one at a time. Clustering, failover system, combining multiple similar resources together. Okay? Grid computing is on demand, where as you need more demand, you simply plug more, more servers into the grid to give yourself more power. And this is how we get rid of over under provision. If you've got a bank of servers, you can redistribute those servers virtually wherever the demand is, can't you? So what you do, you, you monitor how much demand there is, how much load there is on the servers, and if it gets to a certain level, you simply plug another server into the grid, and it levels out. And when we work on our lab tasks, you'll see, we'll do just this, we'll, we'll uh, stress test our servers, you'll see the load on each server, we'll shove an extra server in, and you'll see the load drop across the servers. And as the demand drops, we can pull the, pull the uh, server out, and, the, and the, the load goes up on the rest of them. Virtualization, the clever thing about this is a single physical box can run lots of different servers. And each server is completely self-contained. It has its own root account. It has its own, um, you know, has its own, um, own tenant who can look after that server. So, so the creative server is actually a virtual server on the university infrastructure. It doesn't actually exist. It's a server on, on, the, on, a, on, the, uh, on a piece of hardware somewhere, sharing the space and the CPU and the, and the memory with lots of other servers. OK, cloud computing. This is the kind of the, the key slide here. This is what we mean by cloud computing. If it ticks all these boxes, it's cloud computing. So the first thing is on-demand self-service. So rather than you having to put things on, have a system where it automatically adds extra servers when the demand goes up. If someone needs more capacity, they should be able to just almost go to a website, say, I need three more servers, hit a button, and they've got three more servers. OK, this is what we mean by on-demand. Ubiquitous access basically means it's got to be open standards, so any client can access it, any device can access it. So things like your web service API is a, is a classic example of that. Resource pooling, where you have a set of a massive set of standard bits of hardware and you can pull these together to do different things and the resources kind of pull together. Elasticity, in other words, can we stretch, can we contract, can we adjust the size of our, of our servers on demand? A measured service. So if you're leasing your servers, how do you charge? You might charge on bandwidth, so you need a way of measuring bandwidth. You might charge on CPU usage, so you need a way of controlling CPU usage. You might, uh, you might charge by RAM, in which case you need to be able to control the amount of RAM on each of these, on each of these servers, or the number of servers. And resiliency basically means you need 99.9999% uptime. And one of the languages I'll show you today has, um, I think it's seven second downtime in 10 years. That's the, that's the tolerances these guys work to. Seven seconds in 10 years. And I'll talk about how you program to this sort of, this sort of um, resilience. And there's four things we need to think about when we talk about the cloud. First of all, the servers, where do we plonk our stuff? The physical servers and the virtual servers. The software, how do we, in order to write software that's going to run smoothly on thousands of computers at the same time without any issues? Okay, now think about the issues, the problems there. If you're going to run the same software on thousands of computers and they're all going to talk to each other, and you want seven seconds downtime in 10 years, you've got to have some damn good programming languages to do this with. And I'll tell you about those a bit later. Next thing is files. If you've got files which have to be shared over thousands of servers, we need a very clever way of managing files. We can't just stick files on a hard drive somewhere. That isn't going to work, is it? Because one demand, one request might go to one server, the next request might go to a completely different server somewhere else in the world. So we need a way of managing these files across thousands of servers. And how do we store data? I haven't called it databases. I've called it data stores because, as you'll discover, relational databases are rubbish at the cloud. We can't use them. Now, three delivery models, which we need to talk about. There's IAAS, PAAS, and SAAS. Any idea what these stand for? I'll talk about these now, and then we'll, we'll skip the next few slides. IAAS. IAAS is infrastructure as a service. In other words, you let rent out the infrastructure, and that's how Amazon works. So in other words, you rent out virtual servers, but what the client puts on those servers is up to them. You rent bandwidth, you rent servers, and what you're offering is a, is a very flexible, elastic approach 
to servers. And that's where it stops. So they can choose whatever software they want to run on it. They can put whatever web service they want to run on it, whatever, whatever tools they want to run on it, whatever software, anything. It's up to them. And that's how Amazon works. PWS. You've been using PWS in uh, 321. Platform as a service. In other words, you offer the hardware, the infrastructure, but also the frameworks, the tools to build your software. Yeah, just like you know, we used a Google App Engine, didn't we, in 321? Well, that's platform as a service. Basically, what Google are doing, they're giving you the infrastructure and the tools to build your web service. They're giving you a data store, aren't they? Yeah. Notice that's not relational, is it? The, uh, the uh, Google App Engine data store is not, relational, not a relational database, for very good reason, which we'll talk about later. Uh, they're giving you the software, you can use Java, you can use Python, but they're giving you the frameworks. The last one is what most people think about as cloud computing, and this is software as a service. Software as a service, things like Google Docs, you know, Google Drive, things like uh, Office 365, where they're giving you the, pl the infrastructure, the tools, but also the software is already written. So it's almost like you know, accessing your desktop software on the cloud, on the internet. And that's what software as a service is all about. So when we talk about the cloud, we could be talking about infrastructure, platform, or software. And you need to be very carefully differentiate between the two. We're going to focus on infrastructure as a service for this particular six weeks, because you're all familiar with software as a service, and you've done 3 2, one com, so you're familiar with platform as a service. So the only one you're not familiar with is this infrastructure one. And that's really the most powerful. I'll flick through those ones because we've done that. Right, deployment models, public, private, hybrid community. Public is what you use when you use Amazon, S Amazon EC2, the Amazon Web Services. <coughs> it's run by an organization who kind of rent out the space. They'll rent you a server, they'll rent you the bandwidth to use your, to develop your software. Private is what the university runs. We have a cloud system, a private cloud in the university. That's how creative exists, because we basically plugged in creative into the cloud. Hybrid is an interesting model. It's where it's a combination of the, of the two above, where it's maybe a large organization where a lot of it's private to the internal organization, but some bits are public. So they might have a website or some web tools which people can use, but then there's some private part of it. A community is where it's owned by the community. It might be, I think Red Hat um, have their own cloud, which any Red Hat users can use. Does that make sense? It's a sort of owned by the community approach. I can fix those now. Right, challenges, issues. It's not the perfect, it's not the silver bullet. There are some issues you need to be aware of. The first one is security. If you're hosting all your data off-site, you've got major security concerns, haven't you? People accessing it. Lock-in. If you're tied into a particular cloud vendor, are they using open standards? Can you take your stuff? If the prices change and fluctuate, could you move your cloud somewhere else to a different vendor? And that's, we're going to talk about the standards involved in that. The pay for use fees, if you get a really heavy usage, your fees are going to get horrendous, aren't they? Imagine if you, imagine if you hosted Moodle in the cloud. We do. The usage fees are horrendous. They moved it last summer into the cloud and it's costing a fortune to run because of, because of these uh, bandwidth fees and, and server fees and so on. Fast paced evolution, technology changes so quickly. The software you're going to be using you can't download binaries. They don't exist. Or if they exist, they're so out of date, as in six months old, that they're useless. We're going to be compiling our software from source. We're going to be downloading the latest source from GitHub. We're going to be compiling the code on the, on the, on the servers as part of the lab tasks. Uh, because in two months' time, that'll be out of date as well. This is moving so quickly. So we need, to, we need to teach you the cutting edge stuff. And also, you're dealing with a partner, an organisation, who you may never meet face-to-face, -face, who may not, you may not have any, uh, you know, any meetings with. So you've got a lot of trust involved. Okay, software development. This is where it gets really, really interesting. There are traditional ways of programming. What you've been taught so far. The way you've been taught so far doesn't work in the cloud. You've been taught traditional programming, haven't you? Sequential, where the program starts at the top and goes to the bottom and then stops. Whether it's a Python script, 
whether it's a C++ script, whether it's a Visual Basic script, it's very sort of linear, isn't it? Unfortunately, cloud programming has challenges. So traditional program, I'm talking about function, about procedural, um, procedural programming, um, object-oriented programming. You know all these stuff you learnt in 1.10, 2.10? Forget it, it doesn't work in the cloud. We have to have a completely different way of working to, to work on the parallel systems. Our software's got to work in parallel with tens of thousands of users over dozens of servers, seamlessly. Asynchronous. You can't hang around waiting for resources to happen because a database lookup or a file lookup takes time. The hard drive is slow. You've got, you've got to be doing other things when you're waiting for stuff to come back. So you've got to be very asynchronous. And there's lots of external events. You could be hit with 100,000 hits a second from, a, from an API you've, you've developed. Now, there's a special, there's something called the 10K, the, the 10K challenge, which is, can you build a system which responds to 10,000 simultaneous hits in the same second? And we're gonna talk about a special web server which can do just that. Okay, a special web server which can which is solve the 10K challenge. It will survive 10,000 hits a second from external, external um, connections. Now, with Apache, you're looking, looking about um, 1,000 before the thing starts killing over and dying. So 10,000 is a magic number. And, you know, even on the Raspberry Pi, you can get about uh, three, or 4,000 hits a second, and it will cope with it. So it's a really, really powerful little piece of software. So here's the challenge. Parallel computing. We've got to cope with the same software running on lots of computers. We've got to be able to scale up and down. We need to be able to... If we develop some new software, we can't afford to take our, our API down, can we? If you've got tens of thousands of people using it all the time, like Facebook or Twitter, you can't afford to take down your system whether you upgrade it, where you put your software in. You need to have the hot swap. Literally compile some code and hot swap the compiled code in while the server's still running. And it should still work. And I'll show, there's some software that can do just that. Um, Multi-platform, it has to run on you know, Windows, Linux, Mac, or whatever. Multi-paradigm, it needs to support object-oriented programming, where we need to use object-oriented programming, procedural programming, and a special thing called functional programming, which I'll talk to you about in a, in a moment. And improved client side, we need to have an ultra-responsive system. It's got to be really quick at responding. Think about how people have to wait for their, for their data. Now, this is why we can't use object-oriented programming for concurrent programming for, for the cloud. We can't have external states. If the state of one server depends on the state of another server and you lose the connection between the servers or you have a slow, slow connection, you're stuffed, aren't you? Every block of code has to be self-contained so it can run on its own. Uh, it must support massive multi-threading. In other words, if it, if it gets to a point where it has to go and do something, it needs to spawn a thread go off and do it and get on with something else in the meantime. And deadlock is where things just grind to a halt. We cannot afford deadlock. Most of these, most of these uh, languages support a single thread for all users. Everyone connects to the same thread. Imagine if you lock that thread. If you've got 10,000 people a second connecting to a single thread, you can't afford for any locks on that thread, can you? You can't afford any delays on that thread. You've got to receive a request, bounce it into a, um, spawn another thread to handle it, and then get, get back to dealing with somebody else. So we have something called functional programming. And this is the, uh, this is the big buzzword in cloud. And a functional program, that's a symbol for functional programming. The lambda symbol. Who's, uh, who did A-level maths? Lambda, lambda functions? Didn't do lambda? Well, lambda is the letter of the Greek alphabet, which is used to identify function. Hence, lambda programming. And lambda calculus is functional programming, basically. And the idea is, it's a very powerful language. You can write programs without loops. You can create looping code without building loops. You can create conditionals without writing conditionals. It's an amazingly powerful language, but you have to completely rethink the way you program in this. And there's two features of functional programming which are really, really, really important. Functions are first-class citizens. Wherever you can put a variable, you can put a function. 
<coughs> and what language have you used where you can drop, you can drop functions as parameters? You call a function, and in one of the parameters, you put another function. You did it in 305. Hmm? JavaScript. JavaScript implements this idea of functions first class citizens. So, JavaScript, you've been, I haven't told you what it was, but you've actually been using sort of some feature of functional programming in JavaScript. And that's how your JavaScript client can respond so quickly and was very, was very responsive. Because it was using this idea of multi threading and using. Um, first class citizen functions. The second one is more interesting. In pure functional programming, variables are immutable. Think about it for a minute. Now, you've also, if you're doing 387, you've come across this idea of immutable variables. Guys, NS strings are immutable, aren't they? NS arrays are immutable. NS dictionaries are immutable. This is for, basically, once you've created the variable, you can't change it, which means you can happily pass that variable around your code and it can't be changed. Therefore, if something breaks, you know exactly where that, where that variable is set. Yeah, so you're not, you haven't got one part of the program trying to change a value that's being used by someone else in the program. You can create a variable and quite happily use it around your program without any, uh, any side effects. Okay, talk about that one talked about that one okay so why is this good well you can do multi-threading really easily if you can't if you can pass a variable to a set to a thread and it can't be changed you can't mess your thread up you can't make any nasty side effects to your to your code there's no external states or dependencies okay once you've got the data there it stays the it stays that way it doesn't change parallel programming you can run functions massively in parallel Without worrying, to, without worrying about state changes and, and uh, corruption between the, between the uh, threads. And hot deployment. You can, you can compile code and drop compile code into already running programs and it just continues running. And pure functional languages are based on this language here. Lisp. Very old language. This is the great granddaddy of functional programming languages. Uh, we could develop Enlightenment because it's got very few practical applications, but in terms of pure programming and getting your brain around things, it's like the Rubik's Cube. You can, you can play, fiddle with it for hours just trying to get things to, you know, get things to be elegant. And, and like mathematical functions, the code is very short and elegant. You haven't got these lots of lines of code and semicolons and all this, this and the other. There are two implementations of um, Lisp. One is called Clojure, and this is very important because it runs on the Java Virtual Machine. So if you've got the JVM installed, Java runtime, on your computer, you can run Clojure on that Java runtime. So it's cross-platform so cross by default. The second one is Erlang. It's got a bit of an interesting reputation, Erlang. Erlang was developed by um, Siemens in the uh, 1980s for telephone exchanges and, smart and, and um, mobile phone exchanges. Now you think about how resilient they have to be, these phone exchanges. They have to be, the uptime has to be amazingly high. And this was a language built for, for, for telephone exchanges. So, and it's designed for massively scalable systems. All the phone providers, all the uh, you know, Orange or EE e and the rest of them, all their systems are written in Erlang. So Vodafone use Erlang, E use Erlang, T-Mobile use Erlang. It's the main language for telecoms communication because it's so resilient and so scalable. You're using banking, e-commerce, uh, instant messaging. That's all written in Erlang. And it's, it's, the, it's a really, really, it's the best. If you're going to write a really reliable system, it's the best language to choose by miles. OK, now the problem is very few languages are pure functional languages. OK. So very few languages are purely functional, but a lot of languages have functional programming features in them. Uh, the key ones are closures and lambdas. They're the key features. And JavaScript, which is what we're going to be using for this part of the assignment, don't we work do Erlang? That's for, your, that's for your own exercise. A closure is a nested function that has access to the variables from the parent. So if you create a function in JavaScript and you create a function inside it, it can see the variables from its parent function. 
it's kind of the opposite of um, encapsulation, the opposite of um, variable scoping in something like C++ or Python. If you declare a variable in Python, it can be seen by the... No, it's okay. It's, it's okay. It's good. It's good. So, so in other words, if I create variables and I create a, a, an inline function, an anonymous function, that function can read those variables. But they can only go one level up. So if I want to hide the variables from the next level up, I create an anonymous function to inc incorporate the whole thing, encompass it, and that way I've hidden the variable scope. So it's one level up. A lambda is what we call in JavaScript an anonymous function. We've done those, haven't we? When we dealt with the web service, the APIs, we did anonymous functions for AJAX calls, didn't we? On success, yeah, on error, and that's how that's 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 called a lambda. That's called lambda programming. So I'm giving you the technical terms now for what we've already already covered. Right, these languages support features of functional programming. JavaScript, okay, which is cool because that's what we're going to be using. Python also supports functional programming features. Okay, so if you're into your Python, you should be able to look at this and identify how it does it. Current Java doesn't. They've delayed Java 8, but they're going to build functional programming into Java 8 when it comes out sometime this year. But that's what they said last year. And C Sharp also has Lambda programming functionality in it. So it's becoming more and more mainstream. Okay, cloud storage. Let's think about data, stuff information it is been this broadest term so if you think about the information that's stored in a business some of it's in relational database isn't it you've got you know normalized data lots of tables all linked together some of it's unstructured data text files csv files xml files things which aren't really in the database you've also got documents files word documents powerpoints videos mp3 files that's all there, all data now, together, we now think of all this data as one. If you imagine all this data as one big set of data, the name we give it is big data. Okay? And the three characteristics, characteristics of big data, a huge amount of it. Think about terabytes of hard drive space and videos and, and, and uh, audio files and Word documents and PowerPoint presentations and accounts and all this that and the other. There's a lot of data there, isn't there? <coughs> High velocity means it's changing all the time. So if you're, on a, if you're running an API and you've got thousands of people, all that data is constantly changing, moving, uh, modif being modified, deleted, added to, and so on. And there's a huge variety of data, all different file formats and different sorts of data in there. So if we're going to build a cloud system, we've got to support this sort of data. If we can't support this data, we haven't got a, we haven't got a working system. So what we're going to do is look at comparing some databases. Okay, remember that slide. They are the three features of relational data of, of any database. CAP. Any idea what it stands for? CAP. You've done 220 guys last year. You must have covered CAP. You covered ACID, haven't you? ACID. It's the key feature of relational databases. The one thing it does really well. No? no never, never dealt with that. Okay. CAP is the three features of a database. Consistency. So all the clients have the same view of the data. So if you've got 10 databases linked together on 10 servers, if you connect to one database, you see exactly the same data as another database. Two people accessing the same doing the same query we'll see the same results at the same time availability means people can access data when they want to they can read and write there's no delays okay they don't get locked out of the system and partition tolerant means it runs over multiple partitions on multiple servers that makes sense doesn't it so it's consistent you can always get the data you want availability you can always get the data whenever you need it and partition tolerant, it means it runs nicely over multiple servers without any problems. So let's keep those three, those three features in mind. Now, the problem is with databases, you can't have all three. You, can't, you can only have two out of the three. So a relational database has two of those features, but not the third one. So which is the one that's missing from relational databases? 
CAOP. No. It's got to be concurrent. That's what ACID's all about. You have to have, has to be consistent. P. It's P. Why is, it, why is P the one that's missing? It's got the other two, isn't it? So it's therefore the other one's got to be missing. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about how we scale our system for a moment. Now, when we talk about cloud, we talk about horizontal scaling and vertical scaling, how we, how we scale our systems. Okay, so let's understand what's going on before we talk about more databases. So there's our server. Let's talk about vertical scaling. Vertical scaling is really easy. That's vertical scaling. We ship more CPU, more processing power in there. We overclock things. We, 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 put, we put more cores in. We add more RAM. We have more hard drive space. We basically have the same number of servers, and we just make them bigger. OK, that makes sense, doesn't it? The problem is Moore's law kicks in quite quickly, and you can't have a cloud system using vertical scaling. Because if you want one really, really powerful computer, it's going to cost you a fortune, isn't it? And it's going to become redundant very quickly. So let's think about horizontal scaling. That's horizontal scaling. We take our server and we just, instead of having one server, we have seven servers, or 20 servers, or 2,000 servers. So we take commodity hardware, cheap, cheapish server hardware, and we just have lots and lots and lots and lots of them. The advantage of that is when you start running that space, instead of having to throw stuff away and upgrade the server or chuck the whole server away, we just shove more servers in. And we keep racking up more and more servers to give ourselves more capacity. OK, so that's an example of horizontal scaling. So we basically have a rack of, of identical hardware and we just keep shoving more hardware into the rack to give ourselves more capacity. That makes sense. So this becomes our cloud. This becomes our cluster in our cloud. Lots and lots of these servers. And these are just Intel Xenon servers. You know, each one's got its own hard drives, its own RAM. They're just servers. They're just computers. So think about that for a moment. Let me show you the next generation of clustering. What are you looking at there? Look carefully at that. What, 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 do you, what do you see? Look at the scale of it. It's about that big. It's about six inch square. That is where things are going. That is the HP Moonshot server system. Each of those is a computer. And that's a 4 u rack, so it's about that tall, about that wide, and that long. That's what we mean by clustering and by grid computing. So we have there 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, about 50 computers in one rack, in one 4 u rack unit. So think, just think about that for a minute. What I haven't told you is the power of each of those computers. They are 64-bit ARM processors. They're the same processors you've got in your Samsung Galaxy <coughs> phone. So they're building servers now out of ARM processors, out of phone technology. Each of those computers consumes one watt of power. That is why they're moving to this system. So instead of having a big pro server which pumps out loads of heat and wastes lots of energy pumping heat out, then you buy air conditioned units to try to get rid of the heat, so you cost you twice the amount of money, you simply run servers that don't generate the heat in the first place. So this whole thing runs off a 50 watt power supply. This is what Google are using, this is what Apple are using, this is what Amazon are using for their servers. They're using racks and racks of these, tens of thousands of smaller servers. And when you buy it, you buy an empty rack and you buy a handful of these to start you off. And when you need more, you simply buy a box of them and just shove them in. And they have little lights, green lights or red lights. So if they're failing, the little red light comes up and you just pop it out and chuck a new one in. And they're cheap enough to be able to just chuck it away when you've, uh, if, if they fail. That's the future of servers. So when we look at that picture, what we're looking at is one of those blades that sits in the server. And that's why, if you're going to be serious about working in industry, working with... Uh, server technology, you've got to get your head around cloud, okay? Because it's so important you understand how these things operate. 
So in lab exercise, we're going to start with our Raspberry Pi. We're going to build a node. So every time I teach you a new technology, you're going to build that node using that technology. So when we talk about NoSQL, we'll build a NoSQL node. When we talk about um, um, buckets, we'll build a bucket. When we talk about um, uh, functional program, we'll build, we'll build some functional programs on the node. But then what I want you to do, I would like you to link together in groups. I'd like to build a cluster, a small cluster. And that's where virtualization will come in, because you can build an image and then very quickly clone that image out to all the Raspberry Pis. And in theory, once you've got it working, you should be able to scale. The, the uh, world record is 64 Raspberry Pis in a single cluster. We can beat that. We can build 100 node cluster in Raspberry Pis. I've got switches, I've got cables, I've got power supplies. We're going to have small labs on a Wednesday morning and just really go crazy with this and see if we can build massive systems. Okay? We'll have to, then we'll apply. So we need to video this. So bring, you, bring you, your, your phones in with the cameras. We'll get lots of video footage of this and we'll, we'll put a YouTube video together. Yeah? Of building this massive, this massive cluster. Now, storage options. There are two main ways you can store your data. There are relational databases, which we know about, we know and love from 220, don't we? And there are no SQL databases. Okay, you've done all this to death, haven't you? We're going to focus on this one. Now, relational databases, we know the technology. We normalize things, we break things into little tables, we break everything apart. We'll go into more detail on this later on. That's where our, our relational databases fit into the cap. They're very available, they're very consistent, but they're really crap at scaling over multiple servers. If you scale over more than three or four servers, it, it spends more clock cycles trying to synchronize the data than serving data to the end user. Because it's trying to be always available and always concurrent. And it can't do all three. So this is the ACID, this is SQL. This is what, what the relational database is trying to do. Uh, Atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. This is the feature. It makes sure everyone sees the same data, it's reliable, it's, you know, it's consistent, you've got transactions, all that sort of thing. The problem is, I won't go through this in great detail, the big feature, the big problem is it just doesn't scale properly. So for cloud computing, we have to abandon relational databases. We can't use them anymore. So we're going to have some different sorts of databases. There are four different sorts of database and in your first 20 odd years of your life, you've only covered one of them. We're going to cover that one and that one, and if we have time, we'll cover graph as well. So we're going to quadruple your knowledge of databases in four weeks. Key value, Amazon S3, buckets, storing files, document databases, CouchDB for storing uh, uh, JSON data, you know, objects and arrays and, and, uh, and uh, dictionaries, and graph databases that store relationships. And NoSQL sits there. So what's missing from NoSQL? Which is? Consistency. Consistency. Because it uses what's called base, which is the kind of the anti-acid. Basically available soft state eventual consistency. So it guarantees availability, which is important for an API, isn't it? If people are connecting to your API, it's really important to get data. Soft state. The state can change even without input, so it's kind of very fluid. Eventual consistency. If eventually things will, like, like water levels in buckets with pipes, eventually the, the, the data will level out across the servers. But there will be times, probably most of the time, where you won't get exactly the same data from different nodes. But that's the sacrifice we're making to get, make it really fast and really scalable. But for, for an API, it doesn't matter if there's a minute or two when the data is slightly different, does it? The important thing is it's available, yeah, and it scales well. So, very quickly, we're going to do virtualization using uh, Linux containers. This, this order may change. We're going to do functional programming. We're going to cover load balancing if we have time, which is how we do this 10,000 challenge, or how we have multiple, uh, the same software on multiple servers and load balance between them. We're going to do distributed data stores, buckets, we're going to cover NoSQL databases, and if the time allows, it, it might be four or seven, I can't decide which, we may get a chance to touch on graph databases. You need to bring your Raspberry Pis, you need your kit as usual, 
I would strongly recommend you have lots and lots of SD cards because you won't want to reformat your card every week. So if you've got to get lots of cheap SD cards, you can build one system each week and keep it and work on it and maintain it. Uh, usual stuff, usual stuff. Right. This is quite a cool book, by the way. I'm introducing this now because it's because uh, I want you to um, you know think about this. This this book covers seven different database technologies. Yeah, one chapter for each technology. So if you want to get a head around NoSQL, look at that. Um, that's it. Okay. Perfect timing. Any questions? So lab this week is finishing off your assignment. Okay, there's no practical lab task for this week. We start the lab tasks for the new stuff next week.